What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Blood on the Razor Wire TV, where we bring it to you real and we bring it to you raw. If you haven't already, hit that subscribe button, hit the like button, share the video. I know some people have commented on some of the people that we've had on that were, you know, cops at federal prisons. We had an agent on. Um, we do a lot of stuff like that so that people can get both sides of the fence. And sometimes some guys are affected where they don't always come across clear. Today, I got a guy that spent many, many years working in the Federal Bureau of Prisons. He was a lieutenant. He ran the shoe when Barry Mills and Bingham and all them guys were over there. But you know what? We're going to talk to him. Tim, tell the people who you are. and We're going to talk a little bit about, you know, your experiences in the federal prison system. All right, Chad and the viewers. Um, my name is Tim. Um, I started in October 1992. I'm retired now. Um, I spent time at Terminal Island when it was a medium, medium high. Uh, uh, it was just a, a different bureau back then, man, in the 90s. And I did some TAD in uh, Lompoc. I was on Special Operations Response Team. If uh, viewers don't know, 1995, the West Coast went up due to crack cocaine. Um, mandatory minimums changed. So it was kind of them against the whole system. So the whole West Coast went up. And um, so I spent some time there. I did some airlifts. You know, like I said, I worked shoe, worked the units. and. Yeah. Let me ask you this. So you were involved in the crack riots when all the laws didn't get changed and things just went crazy in the Bureau? Yeah, yeah, and it went up. There was really no word it was going up. There were little incidents that occurred. Uh, Lompoc, of course, back then was uh, uh, the big uh, big pen on the West Coast, man. You know, eventually when they opened USB Victorville, we transferred those hardheads up to Lompoc and, and took them to, uh, to uh, USB. USP Victorville, and then they turned uh, Lompoc into FCI. But yeah, back in the day, it was rocking and rolling, and uh, and uh, yeah, they they were fighting us, you know. What was it like going into that type of situation? Uh, as a young kid, um, fresh out of the core, it was you know I was on like I said the special ops team um, um, or sort they called it, and uh, and it was kind of. You know, I spent time in the golf, so it was kind of just like, uh, all right, let's get our hands dirty. Let's get down. You know, you didn't yeah, you didn't have fear at that time. You just uh, handled your business, you know. And when you went in there, you guys went in there with, you know, non-lethal weapons and stuff like that, right? Yeah, non-lethal weapons. In fact, uh, um, there was a situation at Terminal Island where uh, we got wind from SIS that uh, uh, the groups in J unit, which was, you know, well, you walk into J unit, the term island had all different kinds of units set up, but J unit, you would go in and it's the typical, it looked like San Quentin where you walk in and there's like four or five tiers up. So they were all barricaded back there and they were going to take a counselor hostage. And we actually went to the armory to get uh, lethal weapons to put on the compound and the warden was all for it. And then of course, you know, it came down from the region that that was, that was kanked, but, but yeah, it was, uh, it was rough. We fought them, you know. They have knives, and what type of weapons did the prisoners have? Uh, you know, the typical, they had shanks, they had uh, tomahawks, you know what tomahawks are, um, the locks and the socks. Um, but, yeah, it was, you know, it was uh, every unit. I think each unit had between, I don't know, between 120 and 140 inmates, you know. And, and back then, back then, you know, a lot of these setups, I want to kind of go into that, like, you, your viewers, um, if you were at an institution or know somebody who works at an institution that was built past 2002, 2003, they all kind of mirror each other, you know, like Big Sandy, Pollock, uh, 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 Coleman, uh, USP Lee, uh, USP Victorville, they all kind of mirror, they're all built the same. Same thing with the FCIs, like the FCI Mendota would match like the number one or number two FCI at Victorville. but Back in the day, it was the old school institutions that had character like Terminal Island, Lompoc, you know, um, Atlanta, Leavenworth, Lewisburg. They're all built differently, you know. So, so yeah, we couldn't at Terminal Island, you could lock the front door. So picture you being a big Sandy in a unit. We could lock the front door, but we couldn't lock them in, in their cells. You know, it was an old joint. You know, they, you couldn't contain them. How did you guys end up getting things under control if you couldn't lock these guys in cells and stuff? Oh, we just we just came in hard. 
you know, like I said, less than lethal. Um, we had the towers uh, uh, unloading, you know, their rounds. Um, Lompoc, uh, a real good buddy of mine, Steve. I'm not going to say last names. He's retired. Lieutenant, uh, great dude. He did his career at Lompoc. And, um, yeah, the, the main corridor went off. Uh, I think M unit at Lompoc went off. They killed the lights. Um, and they were ready for the teams to come in, getting hit with uh, – because back then, every unit had a, a, a pool table. So we we're, you know, getting hit with the uh, pool balls and, you know, they'd ice up cans of soda and we'd be, you know, getting hit. So yeah, it was no joke, man. Lives were definitely on the line, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. When you go into a situation like that, is your adrenaline pumping? Are you like, all right, man, this is it. Oh yeah. Yeah. You were amped up. You know, it was, uh, it was kind of, uh, uh, the, the fight or flight. You know what I mean? If you had it in you, you had it in you. You know, of course, there were there were there were some staff that, you know, ran to their unit office and locked themselves, you know, hit under a desk. But, you know, it's like you either have it or you don't. You can't make yourself respond in a certain way. And um, and yeah, so adrenaline was high. Heart was pumping. And um, yeah, it was on. So let me ask you this. Eventually, you end up at Terminal Island, right? And we'll get back into that stuff, too. But you end up in Terminal Island, and they bring Barry Mills over there. That's when this big trial's going on, and Bingham comes over there. I think Weeks comes over there. A whole bunch of guys, right? Tell the people a little bit about Barry Mills and, and the whole Aryan Brotherhood thing that happens, how they bring them over to the prison that you're the lieutenant in the shoe, I believe, right? Well, I acted some, but I was an officer in there. I was the OIC. I think I was number two, number three. But... You know, I want to tell your viewers that that I'm not um, uh, I'm I'm not putting uh, holding the AB in a high pedestal. You know what I mean? You know, we all heard rumors of them. We never saw them because we are an FCI. So at that time, it was a pivotal point in all our careers. My buddy, uh, Big Rich, was in there with me. Uh, Big John, they called him John Boy. We had my buddy Mac, uh, another guy named Val. And um, like we spoke earlier that, you know, for the viewers, you know, back in the day, union was kind of strong, but they didn't really they didn't really uh, hold accountability as far as like, you know, exchange, you know, putting in for different posts and stuff. So like we talked about, Chad, that that um, the shoe lieutenant hand picked his crew and we knew something was going down. Um, when we started trickling in, like we got Brian Healy, uh, was an AB member, I, I believe out of Pelican Bay and he killed the Selly, and that, that was kind of, he was ordered to do it. It was his friend. I, I want to say his name was Art Rufo. Um, then it turned out that, uh, um, it was a real, kind of a joke. You know, they were like, oh, we just wanted to see if you would do it. So they brought him down to say USA thinking he was going to roll on him. So we got him and then he vanished. And then we got corn fed and we were like, what's going on? You know, these guys, our administration, um, you know, we can't really, they don't have the capability or the knowledge to deal with this high caliber of inmate. And like we talked about, um, it's kind of hard to explain for the viewers, you know, the newer institutions, um, the shoe program. And I may say in this interview, I may say shoe, I may say the whole, the bucket, add seg, seg. So bear with me when i say all those that means the special housing unit um but they're set up differently all over you know the newer joints may have one two three four five six a side b side you know holding a max of 300 inmates but at terminal island we had you know it was like two box cars you know we had one tier upstairs we had another tier that's it two tiers we held i think uh, a total of 70 inmates max 75 um, so here it is an FCI and we're getting some AB dudes in and we got corn fed. He was there for a minute and then the marshals took him uh, to LA. I don't know what he said or did or how he was included in the indictment. He left and then we got Danny Weeks from ADX. Um, and I want to say that was the H unit. They called it the snitch unit at the ADX. And I believe that, that, uh, Danny Weeks and, uh, uh the others that were up there were, we're using the feds to get, you know, the food they haven't had in 20 years, burgers, pizzas, watching movies, they're feeding them, whatever, you know what I mean? 
so we got Danny Weeks. They thought that uh, he was going to roll. Um, I believe he didn't. He was gone. And then it was kind of quiet. And then we got a new batch in, like we talked about. We got uh, we got Tank. We got Prince Bay. We got Don Kennedy. And we got Big Mark Owen. Uh, they were all in the bottom tier. And I think Jessner was kind of losing, uh, losing ground because these dudes weren't rolling over. You know what I mean? And West Valley... LA could or West Valley and Orange County detention center couldn't hold them. And then like we talked about Chad, that the LA was packed in DCLA. So, so um, our administration at the time's like, Hey, you know, we can take this on. We can do it. We got room. We're the only closest, you know, federal facility in that area at the time, you know? So, um, so we had those guys for a while. Um, they were sold along wrecked alone and then um eventually they kind of disappeared you know they were going to court they transferred i don't know what their actual um um how important they were in the indictments like i said i'm not i'm unaware of that and then it was quiet and then we talked chad that facilities came in here we are a freaking fci you know two tier shoe like 50 cells deep you know you know, side by side on either side on both tiers. And then facilities came in or, you know, maintenance, CMS, some people call them, and they revamped the upper tier, you know, like uh, some of the USDs, the corridors, you know, like, like we talked about, Chad, it was like every 10 feet there were, they put up a, they put up a grill and we're like, what's going on? What, who are we getting now? You know? And then um, it turned out we got, um, um, Jester wanted to, uh, on that 40 count indictment, wanted to put those four up for the death penalty, Barry Mills, uh, T.D. Bingham, Chris Gibson, and uh, Headley. So we got those guys two in the morning on a bus. And we were just like, what? You know, like the officers, none of us had any idea really how to deal with them. You know what I mean? Or what to expect. Um, but they were held in the back behind plexiglass. And like we talked about, cell alone, wreck alone. You know, like Mills had a cell. The cell next to him was Mills Discovery. Then it was Bingham. And next to him, his cell with full of his discovery because they had to have let, access. For, let me ask you this. So they put a whole cell just for their for their legal papers, each each prisoner. Yep. And then they got uh, a TV, TV VCR combination so they could watch surveillance tapes that were admitted into court and, um, you know, shakedowns and stuff like that. You know, so they could go in there anytime they wanted. Like I said, there was no, it was kind of like making up the rules as we go. You know, it's like, okay, how long are they going to be in there? You know, did they, did they use it as an excuse just to come out of the cell to kind of be like, Hey man, I mean, do you, were they really doing legal work? Were they fighting their cases? Did it seem oh, like they, they wanted to win? Yeah, they were fighting. I mean, they were doing life, but they didn't want the death sentence. You know, they kind of had a, a life um, in segregation at ADX. Um, they kind of, like we talked about earlier that, uh, you know, they kind of got some special privileges at Terminal Island just to, I think, the administration just to keep them quiet. Now, they were really respectful. But, you know, it's like the commissary, you know, um, a, a rec time, got a little more rec time than I'm sure they got at the ADX. And uh, so they're really respectful. So they used their time wisely. They were in there. And uh, like I said, they were watching videos. They were watching, uh, reading transcripts. Um, they each got a laptop that obviously wasn't connected to the internet, but they would type their own, you know, discovery. And then my, my guys would, you know, uh, you know, picture a food cart, you know what food carts are. We'd have to throw a printer on top of a food cart, roll it down the tier, plug it in. And then uh, we plug in their, uh, their laptop so they could print their documents. Those cats ever get extra trays or anything like that? Yeah, they got extra food. Like we talked to earlier, you know, the commissary, they were getting J they were getting Gen Pop commissary list, man. Ice cream, sodas. Uh, obviously, they they didn't get the cans, but uh, uh, but they they got chips. They got everything they wanted, and um, they were pretty content. Like we talked about earlier, Chad. I think at the ADX, um, they could talk to each other through vents and stuff. But I think this was the only time in the probably in 20, 25 years they were able to look out of their cell window and talk like Bingham could talk to Mills across the tier, you know? Were they really, were they really close Mills and Bingham? Yeah. Super, super close. All of them were, um, I had an interaction with all of them. Like I said, I, I think at the time, Chris, uh, was like 
kind of the the mouth of the group, the enforcer. So if uh, Mills or Bingham or one of those guys had an issue, um, uh, Gibson addressed it. You know what I mean? So we didn't hear much. I mean, I would talk to him, you know, like, hey, what's up and how you doing today? And but, you know, like, like that, uh, that ex-cop said in Big Sandy, you know, you, you give them what they got coming, what they deserve, man, and they're good. Let me ask you this, right? Because I know people want to know this, right? This is something that people want to know. Because they were Aryan Brotherhood, right? They're, I mean, these are the guys. Like, these are the guys. Did they ever try to play the um, white card in prison? Like, hey, man, you know, look out for a white dude. Because, you know, th- that stuff happens. I mean, people say shit like that. What's up, man? You ever have them say, oh, man, you, you can't give me an extra trade, man? You know you know where I'm going with this. So, did they oh, ever yeah, try yeah. to be like, oh, man, we're white, you're white. Yeah, we're prisoners, but we're white. Look out. No, 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 no Chad. There, there was no... Uh there was no racial lines. Um, they were respectful. They knew what kind of a good deal they had going, even though they're fighting a death penalty. Um, you know, that they, they, we respected them and they respected us. None of them pulled that. None of those four from the ADX pulled that. None of them, you know, like, Hey man, and they didn't talk like that. They didn't, you know, but then like we talked about earlier, Chad, with, uh, when they called in witnesses. So we got the, the state leadership, and those guys were a little different, you know, it was like out of the blue, of course, you know, like, you know, your viewers may, may, uh, may hear, you know, it's, you we're last to know, you know, the Bureau of Execs want to make the decisions and not spread the word down. So one day we got buses of, uh, of, um, the state leadership out of Pelican Bay and we got them, we got, uh, Stinson, like we talked about, Nancy Lowrider, we got, uh, Ruben Castro, Mexican mafia that was gonna, you know be one of their witnesses uh black hand and then we had uh you know grizzle we had chance we had turflinger um yeah we had we had uh, i think they called him bart simpson but yeah we had we had all them dudes from the state how about other cops over there when them dudes roll up man barry mills or some people like i mean kind of like man them dudes are like famous are they like glamorized by them you, you see any of that with any of the officers? You don't have to mention names. If they did, they did. If they didn't, they didn't. Uh, there were there were some like we talked about. Um, you know, I'm not, I don't really want to bring it up, but the whole tattoo thing and rolling up your sleeves and like, oh shit, you know, I'm going to get noticed. And they kind of took an interest in him, but um, but they knew that uh, you know they weren't all about turning staff. You know what I mean? Um, I'm sure if they tried, they could have. But yeah, there were some. But the, like like we talked earlier, Chad, the issue we had is that, uh, you know, here it is an FCI. You know what I mean? Like these, we weren't a pen. We weren't the ADX. We had a small shoe. And then we had uh, we had these heavy hitters come in. So word trickled out onto our yards. And then we kind of had issues with some of the white boys out there, you know, com- uh, you know um, committing minor violations to get in our shoe to pay their respects. That's what we were dealing with. Some dudes will be on the compound. They find out Barry Mills hit the compound. He's in the hole. They they go out there and violate the rules so they can come to the hole and be like, yo, what's up, man? I met Barry Mills or I talked to Bingham or. Well, they, it was probably a bunch of bullshit because they were on the bottom tier and, you know, I, you know, some no, some nobody is yelling up through a vent to, to Bingham or Mills. You know, they're going to be like, what the fuck? Who are you? You know? Might be like, hey, homeboy, send us up some stamps. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. So, but uh, like we talked about, Chad, that it was, uh, you could definitely see the difference, you know, and I'm, I'm not disrespecting the state dudes at all, but, you know, they were, you know, kicking the doors, yelling, you know, they wanted phones. Uh, uh, we would, you know, how the phones work, rolling the phones down to the bean tray, popping them. And, and I, I went down and talked to, talked to Mills after I talked to some of my officers and my fellow officers and, uh, and it was uh, like, hey, man, you know, these guys are kind of out of control, banging doors. And, you know, can you shoot a kite down or something? But like we talked about, Chad, you know, he was like, ah, oh, that's the they're they're affiliated with the state, man. We're fed. I mean, I can say something, but they're kind of on their own program. So. They were a little more disrespectful, right? Yeah. And I want to bring up something that's kind of funny, but it's not. Um as far as like the protocols, you know, what do we do here? What do we do there? So if a dude is put into a discovery room at the beginning of the shift before the next shift comes on, 
that dude is back in the cell. That's that was the policy. So my my buddy Val, he was newer at the time, but he was always, you know, checking doors, checking bean trays, um, making sure it was secured. And he got to a cell door a discovery he thought was empty and the door was open. So here he opens the door and Turflinger pops up from behind these boxes. And they're both looking at each other like, like I'm sure Turflinger has never been out of a cell or had the door cracked in years without handcuffs on. So he was kind of like, and then my buddy was kind of like, oh shit, slammed the door shut. And then they had to put him back in the cell. But, but yeah, that's, uh, yeah, it was a crazy time back then, bro. Did you guys, did you guys laugh that he slammed the door so quick, pick on him a little bit? Oh yeah. Yeah. It was kind of like, you know, it was more like the shit before like, Hey, would he, would you leave it? Oh boy in there. You know, would you leave him in there? This, it could have, could have went bad, but, like I said, he, I guess Turflinger was deer in the headlight. It's like, oh shit, what do I do? You know? But, uh, yeah. but yeah, they, for the most part, it was, uh, you know, it was uh, real rigorous, you know, like um, some of your, of your viewers, you talk about Big Sandy and some of the newer joints and USB Lee and, you know, USB Victorville, the shoe programs, they had, they had showers built in the cells, you know, the old joints like Lompoc and Terminal Island. Uh, they didn't have showers in the cells. So when you pulled rec moves, you had, you know, as soon as you filled up rec cages, you were moving showers, you know? So we're, we're, we're humping. Let me ask you about Barry Mills specifically, right? Him and Bingham. Barry Mills, you said he was respectful. He was quiet. I mean, did he work out? Did he go out there and do burpees? What type of dude was he, man? Besides just being quiet and respectful. He was quiet. He was respectful. He was doing his thing. Uh, when we did rounds, he was either laying on his bunk, uh, of course, with the mattress uh, folded up, doing doing uh, reading a book. Um, typically, they would uh, they were real regimented, so they'd all wake up at a certain time. But because of rec rec time, they didn't really work out in the cells. I mean, they took bird baths and stuff like that, you know. But um, yeah, those dudes would put in put in work on the rec yards, uh, the shoe rec yards. They go out there and pop off 1500 burpees, you know? So they were all about staying fit, um, kind of interacting with, with each other because I, at the ADX, it was limited. I'm sure the communication is seriously limited. So it was kind of like they were back together again, you know, talking. Uh, we had two handlers that came, good guys, that set up office in the back of our shoe. And um, the rec yard was wired up for sound. So they were their handlers. They listened, you know, and, you know, the, those four were, um, uh, uh, you know, they knew what was going on. They knew what to say, not to say. They knew that, you know, they were being monitored. So, yeah, let's talk about that. So they bring in agents and they, they, they put microphones and everything in the rec cages. Were they in their cells, too, and they didn't know? Or I want to say... You know, Chad, it was so long ago. I, I know for a fact the rec cages were, were wired to sound and maybe the cells. I'm not sure. But, yeah, these guys, they were just – but they were, you know, they were just doing their time working on their cases, man. If they weren't in their cell, they were in their discovery cell, you know, printing stuff up, writing letters to family and um, uh, kind of enjoying, I would, I would have to say, um, you know, some of the – luxuries they didn't have at the adx like i said the commissary the food and and all this stuff and and it was uh it was crazy i didn't know how they did it but like we talked earlier the seg lieutenant would go up there and i think it was mills's birthday and they all had they all had the microwave bowls you know empty and uh the seg lieutenant uh shot gibson you know all the bowls all the commissary i don't know how he did it but within 30 minutes, he was handing the lieutenant out steaming hot bowls of tostadas to give to the other guys to have like a, a spread for Mills's birthday, you know? Man. So you're working over there with them, but I want to ask you this, right? They're all facing the death penalty. I mean, the viewers know who the Aryan Brotherhood is. They're facing the death penalty. Were you guys ever worried about them maybe trying to make an escape attempt or killing people, killing staff members like, yo... These guys are going to be balls to the wall if they ever get an opportunity. Was there ever a meeting like that where, where the administrative staff and people talked to you guys said, hey, be very careful because this is possible? It was always be careful when when taking them out. Because like I said, we talked earlier, Chad, you know, moving moving one from their cell to the to their discovery cell to do legal work. It was uh, the black box 
locks, belly chain, leg irons, double locked everything. Um, so there were precautions, but I think that they were so institutionalized that that they didn't even think about it was all about beating the death case to get back to the ADX, you know what I mean? And enjoy what freedoms they had at Terminal Island. So I never got any word of that. Um, we talked about that, that stunt that Barry or uh, Bingham pulled, you know, with the letter out, you know, as far as overtime. So let's, let, minutes- yeah, let's, let's, let's talk about that because I want the viewers to understand that in prison, sometimes prisoners will do things right to get back at staff. Um, to get back at the government, like any opportunity, man, to kind of, you know, get back some of what, you know, you've been given, I guess, in the prisoner's mind. They do, right? And these guys are pretty smart dudes. Um, let's talk a little bit about, a little bit about what Bingham does to kind of say to the government. Oh, yeah. So, so it was towards the end. I, I think they were found not guilty and they were just waiting on transport. I think they were there another week or week, uh, two weeks. But I want to tell the viewers that, you know, at the ADX, when there's zero communication, you know, when you have senses that are kind of deadened, your other senses are super heightened, you know, listening, the smells, uh, uh, the feeling of, you know what I mean? And, um, and so they were very, very, very resourceful and very, very intelligent. Uh, three of them were, but, uh, like I said, we got them at two in the morning on a bus. They had never been to Terminal Island. It was dark. And, um, so I think after the indictment was, uh, uh, the verdict was, was rendered, um, we got them and, and Bingham knew that we set up extra, you know, posts, you know, for security and it was all overtime, straight overtime. And there was a budget with the marshals and, um, and Bingham sent a letter to his girl. I want to say his fiance, wife, girl. I, and I, I want to say she lived in Newport beach. Um, sent a letter out, but it was almost like a poem describing the perimeter of our fucking institution, bro. Like it was like worded like crazy, you know, like water on this side, you know, the mobiles watch the perimeter on this side. There's a building here. There's a South Yard. Uh, executive staff live on a reservation. And the only way they would have known all this is information gathered off of hearing our radios hearing us talk about certain things throughout months and months. And he pieced it all together. And um, he sent that letter out knowing it was going to be intercepted. And uh, he knew that uh, there was going to be more, um, more uh, um, overtime posts. So the budget, I think went from, I don't know, like we talked about two two fifty to like, I think 650 just because of that letter that went out. And, you know, I said some to Bingham taking him down to the rear shoot for transport when the marshals got there, and he just kind of snickered. He had this real southern drawl. You could hardly understand him. Real southern drawl. And he kind of laughed like, yeah, yeah, I got him. I got him. So that was their way of kind of telling the government, go fuck yourself one last time. Like, yep. I'm going to charge you. I'm going to make you guys spend $400,000 because, you, you know, just in case we might escape, which we're not, we just put this poem together to do what we wanted to do to you. So we're going to screw you. And sometimes, you know, guys do certain things to screw people, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think they had obviously any intention. I mean, you know, they were trying to beat the case. They beat the case. We were all respectful. They didn't hold grudges against us. They kind of, they kind of lived pretty good compared to, I assume the ADX at that time, you know, they beat the death penalty. Yeah. Beat the death penalty. But you know, Oh, this guy, I think he meant well, but this AUSA out of Orange County, after the Lewisburg killings and some coded messages coming out of the ADX, he thought he had a case and spent millions of dollars. And, you know, there were some dropouts that that provided uh, information for uh, the prosecution. Um, but uh, but all in all, it was a waste. You know, they just got, I think, another life sentence added on. Life on top of life, they really achieved nothing by doing what they did and spending the money that they spent. But this guy was bent on killing these dudes. He wanted blood, and he wanted a name. And it didn't work out in the end with the death penalty. And then, yeah, Stinson Stinson and a couple of state guys were facing the same. I want to say, what's his name? Blinky, uh, some of your your viewers may know. You can Google these guys. Uh, I forgot. I forget his name. Uh, Was it? 
with Scott Grizzle. We had Slocum there, but you know, Slocum, Turflinger, uh, Griffith, Griffith, Robert Blinky Griffin. Uh, he was facing death penalty. Like I said, Stinson was facing death penalty, but none of them got it. You know, they just got added. They were doing life anyway. You know. Let's talk a little bit. I mean, you worked at Terminal Island. I mean, you were involved in the crack riots. Let's talk a little bit about the BOP and, and kind of some of the stuff that happens there, right? And I'm not saying all cops are bad because they're not. But you ever work with staff that went out of their way to kind of like oppress prisoners? Oh, yeah. Like we would tell, like in the 90s, bro, um, the new officers were really, really receptive. You know, my buddy Steve, which was a lieutenant at the time, really took it. You know, we all did. You know, there was a, I'm a gang of. Tim, I'm definitely taking this somewhere, but go ahead. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So the newer staff, we did have, uh, you know, the uh, the tear warrior, you know, that would go out and, you know, they forgot that these guys have been judged and sentenced already and they want to be a cop and they want to tear up their cells. And and then they wonder because back in the day there were no cameras. So if a dude went off the chain and started tearing up a dude's cell maliciously, you know, uh, matchsticks were were shoved in the lock. The dude couldn't get his lunch for the whole shift or. Or, you know, shit was smeared on the doorknobs and stuff like that, you know. So, so yeah, there there were some uh, cowboys, but they got, they kind of got what they had coming, you know. i ask you that. So, when you get a staff member that comes in there, he's gung-ho, he wants to do nasty shit to prisoners. Do you guys ever tell him, like, hey, look, bro, we're not scared of these people, but you could put us all in a bad situation where, you know, we could end up stabbed because you're doing bullshit that you really don't need to do. Right, like slow down, like slow down, you know. And like uh, like the CEO you interviewed uh, from Big Sandy, you know, like uh, there were certain groups, uh, uh, certain, um, uh, uh, um, you know, STGs, security threat groups that uh, that were super respectful because they didn't want dudes sneaking in their cell. They didn't want drama because they had business going. They had their scams going. They had running. They had the, the things they were doing. Um, but you can only push them so far. You know what I mean? And um, we would try to tell these guys that even at terminal island you know uh, uh usp usp lompoc was uh was a max and it was rocking all the time but you know you know with points a, a dude at usp doing 25 30 years you know his points drop and he ends up at terminal island for like the drug program but he brings that mentality with him so if you push that dude in a corner he's not some lame ass you know fci inmate that's never did in time in a pen you know, he's going to lash out, you know, he's going to spring and, and, you know, we had, in, we had staff assaults, we had staff threats. You know, prison's a whole lot different on the West Coast, whether you're in USP Victorville, you're in Lompoc, you're at Terminal Island. I mean, your politics over there are much different and that you do have guys that, you know, are shot callers, dudes that are respectful, dudes that are respected and other dudes that'll do whatever the big homie says or, or their shot caller says, right? Yeah. Yeah. They'll come in. Um, they kind of, they kind of, uh, they kind of, um, fall into place when we, when we got them, you know, they were unsure of the yard politics and, um, but once we got them, we got an East coast, but normally we wouldn't get East coast dudes. We would, we would, there'd be trans transfers from, from, uh, West coast, like NBC LA or, or NBC San Diego and, um, and Lompoc and, and uh, so we wouldn't get uh, a few from Leavenworth, but it was pretty much uh, all West, West Coast politics at the time, yeah. You know, one time I seen an A.W., right? He went off on a, on a cop inside the kitchen, and he said, you know what? Get in my office, right? And, and he wanted to talk to the, I mean, he, he blasted him in the chow hall and then realized, hey, all the prisoners are looking. Let me take this guy into the office, right? So, you know, you were a lieutenant. Eventually, you weren't just, a, you know, an acting lieutenant. You became a lieutenant, right? Yeah, I transferred out of Terminal Island. I ended up in uh, another another facility as a lieutenant, yeah. Working as a lieutenant, right, you ever have guys come down to the lieutenant's office and be like, hey, look, man, I don't bother no one. Your officer up here is fucking with me. I'm getting tired of this shit, man. Can you say something to this cat? You ever have to, you know, dress an officer down, let him know, hey, man, what's going on up there? Oh, yeah, when I did rounds, you know, there were, there were a few. You know, there were solid dudes, but there were a few that, you know, you know, respect my authority you know and it's like you're new they don't know you you can't come in here and they don't respect the badge they don't respect you you know what i mean and uh if you got like give me like four minutes i would do training i was an fto so i would train these dudes but try to come up with certain ways and this one officer was like 
they need to respect the bads. They need to respect me, not, you know, they need to automatically respect me. And he was having issues in there. So I told him, I said, hey, you know, look out on the flats, go out there, pick any inmate. I don't care. Indian, Asian, Serenio, black, white, pick anyone you want. And he came back with this big black dude. And I didn't really know him, but I did kind of a mock drill. I, I got in this dude's face, you know. I was like, hey, what did you do to make my life difficult today as a lieutenant? What'd you do? What'd you do to waste my time? And this dude was like, I don't know what you're talking about. And I was like in his face, pushing his chest, you know. And then I said, okay, this is a drill. This is just for the, yeah, you're good. So he breathed a sigh of relief. He's like, what's going on? And I said, uh, I said, why didn't you do something? And he said, well, you're kind, you're respected around here and, and you're yelling at me for something. You don't yell at us. So I must have done something. So I was confused. And I said, what if that new officer sitting in that chair did the same exact thing? He goes, oh, he'd be done. He'd, we'd catch him. And I said, there you go. You've got to earn respect. And did it help? I don't know. That's one thing I experienced, right? Like a lot of the old school guys were respectful. They were on some men respect men. And I'm talking about your guys on that side, right? And then you would get these new guys that are gun ho want to go tear up your cell, you know, talk shit to you. And I guess I never looked at it that way where they thought we had to respect the badge. But, man, I, you know, I used to tell people sometimes, yo, man, I ain't never getting out of here. You know, at, at some points I thought that. So I got a 40-year sentence. I got nothing to lose. And sometimes it would grab their attention like the new guys, right? They'd be like, but sometimes it doesn't work, man. Sometimes you do get these new school guys that are just gun ho And usually it's those guys, and I've seen it happen in USP Coleman, where dude pounded the shit out of the cop. Then they came in and transferred like 30 people within three hours. You're, just, Here, you're packing up. You're just to show their, their authority. But, you know, sometimes the young guys are just different than the old guys, right? Right. They were different and they would help me, you know, um, you know, there were little incidences that, you know, I would show these new officers like you want respect. OK, I'll show you how to get respect. So we'd walk out onto the flats and the, the, everybody was, you know, there were gambling tables. You know, if you had a Mexican, an Indian, a black and a white at a table, they're gambling. So I just rolled up and said, hey, man, you got money on this table. Take it in the house. Don't disrespect the officer on camera. And they take it in the house. You know, it's just simple stuff like that. Like we talked about contraband. You know, if you go in and you find this dude's got five burritos, you know, take three and leave two on his bunk. You know, letting him him, him know, like, you do your job, but you know he's kind of got a scam. And I didn't care about nuisance contraband, man. I want to steal off the yard. I want to dope, cell phones. So you think I give a shit about two onions or a pepper, you know? No, but you get cops that'll come in your cell and take everything you got. Onions, pepper, and, and oh, destroy yeah. your cell because now, you had an onion. Yeah, I would have I'd have officers calling me from units like, you know, hey, I found three onions and two tomatoes and I'd laugh at him. I go, what do you want me or hang up on him? You know, or like, what do you want me to throw it in the trash? Unbelievable. So let me ask you this, right? What was one of the biggest busts you ever had in federal prison? Cell phones, drugs, stamps? Um, yeah, so if for your viewers, and I don't know if you know this, but um, I think it, they changed in 2020. But when I started, you'd go to commissary and you could get thirty dollars in coins. So comp, so stamps weren't really the, uh, um, uh, you know, the money on the compound. It was coins, you know, because we had we had soda machines, we had candy ma vending machines in the units, you know. Um, so you know there were, you know, stamps. Stamps are different. Like you know, an officer, um, you know, called and said, "Hey, I got thirty five hundred stamps. I got." you know, 600 books this dude had out on his, on his bunk, but you gotta be, you gotta be careful because, you know, you gotta interview that dude and say, Hey, how much is yours and what's owed? Because we don't want interracial violence. You know what I mean? Over a debt. So SIS would normally roll in and say, okay, they would determine that, Hey, um, you know, um, you know, a quarter of these are the blacks, you know, a quarter of these go to the whites, you know what I mean? So they would kind of shell out and pay the debt and then take what was left over. But uh, we had some, you know, like I said, we would find shanks. Uh, back in the day, we were finding shanks all the time. Um, uh, uh, cell phones didn't come on for me until I transferred as a lieutenant, you know, because back in the day, there was no cell phones. Um, so there was like, there wasn't like five or six cell phones at a time. You know, we found weed, a big thing, 
because some of your viewers um, prior to an incident that happened at a federal prison, one of them, I forget, um, there were no metal detectors for years in the lobby. So you could roll from your car to your unit. You know what I mean? And there was no checkpoint. So once they established that, it was like, okay, there were cops that were like, uh, and in smoking, smoking was outlawed. You know, when I got there, you could have two cartons of smoke, smoke all the time. Um, but, uh, but then they did away with smoking. So tobacco was, a was a moneymaker, just like it would be for dope, you know? And, um, but officers throughout the bureau thought that, okay, it's not dope. How much trouble can I really get into? So we would find huge sandwich bags of tobacco. Um, yeah, tobacco stamps, we'd find dope, but I can't really think of like one huge bust. Um, it was just random. Let me ask you this. While working in the bureau, you ever seen anybody get stabbed? Yeah, yeah. Or even um, killed, or even killed. Terminal Island, there were a few I didn't see outright murdered. We had a lot of drug. We had a lot of ODs. Um, but uh, there were there were inmates stabbed that eventually passed away, died in the hospital. You know, I didn't see I didn't see massacres. Um, uh, yeah, you know, we took a guy, I think the worst one was, um, an officer called, I think after the 10 o'clock count and said, Hey, I found a little blood by this guy's bunk. And we're like, well, send him down to the compound. And he came down, didn't have a shirt on, had a little blood on his chest, but this dude must've weighed 650 pounds, man, a blubber. And he was, uh, we were like, Hey, what's going on? Why was there blood? Oh, I cut myself shaving. Well, turn around, put your hands on the wall. No, he refused. And um, eventually the SIS lieutenant that I think was working morning watch chops at that time, we grabbed the dude and raised his hands up. Then, of course, that separated his fat. That dude must have been stuck 30 times, man. We were, co we were covered in blood and that dude collapsed. So the, the fat was kind of holding it in. So, yeah, we, you know, I see, you know, uh, chomos on the compound get lumped up bad. Like I didn't even recognize them. So I saw some good beatdowns, boots, you know, boots to the head, you know, are no joke. Let me ask you this. So chomos, right? You talk about chomos briefly. You ever get them guys come down there and be like, look, man, I'm a chomo. I can't stay out here. They told me I got to check in. Oh, yeah. We had them both. You would either um, at our level, of course, USPs are definitely, man, if your paperwork's bad, you're stuck. You're done. You're dead. Um, but it, the mediums, you know, where some of the inmates had kind of light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, they would give these guys with bad paperwork, you know, hey, check in. You're, you're not welcome on this compound in this unit. And some would uh, uh, some would buck, say, no, no, I'm good, man. What are you going to do? You know, and they've never done time before. And those are the guys we'd find, you know, laid out on the rec yard. But but you had a lot of them that were scared coming up. And but it really kind of it kind of sucked because uh, it kind of sucked because the inmates. Um, our policies changed and I didn't necessarily agree with it. You know, a chomo comes up, you check his paperwork. Obviously he was threatened. You can tell the kid's scared out of his mind, but our policies were okay. Interview who checked you in. Cause you're not going to shoe alone. You know what I mean? Or you can go with, you can go to shoe on a three Oh five and you can get three Oh fives every month, but, or go back to your unit. I didn't really agree with that. You know what I mean? Because you were disrupting kind of the groups. There was a point a couple of years before I retired, there were chomos in units with white boys that the white boys looked the other way because their cars were small. At the time, the white boy car was small. And, you know, these dudes were bodies in case something jumped off. So they kind of said, you, you program on your own. You sit at your own table. You're not going to sit with us, but you do your thing. We'll do ours. But that was uh, a numbers issue, you know? Let me ask you this, because I want people to understand this in the Bureau of Prisons, like you just said. Guys will come down and they'll be like, hey, man, I got to check in. And you'll be like, hey, man, you got to tell on someone. You can't just check in. You have to tell on someone. So that, you know, you put people in danger by doing that. And the other thing I want to talk about briefly is like the chomos. You ever get a guy come down there and you look up his charges and you're like, this dude's a real piece of shit? You're retired now. I don't know if you can talk about it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There was... I kind of typically kind of would brief uh, go over um, some of their PSIs and stuff. And there was one that we got. He was uh, 33 years old. 
he was he opted when he got into receiving discharge like oh yeah i'm going to shoot i'm locking up he had 55 years i read it and that still haunts me out of my whole career it had to do with infants and yeah it was all bad and as a seg lieutenant you know there's certain there's certain things inmates are entitled to you know it's like you know case managers come by sell the guy wants writing paper the guy wants a a cop out you know what cop outs are um but i would walk by i'd ignore him you weren't supposed to do that, treat everybody the same, but I would ignore him, you know, when he pounded on his door and I went down there and I'm like, what, what do you want? You know, nobody comes. I've been in here a month and I go, yeah, look at your case, dude. I don't even want to be around you. I don't want to look at you. So, yeah, it was it was rough. Yeah. I don't believe me. I know. I mean, I've, I've seen it, you know, in, in, in the low, low security prison. I've seen it. And uh, some of them do is just do vicious things. I but mean, I'm, yeah, dude, I. Were there times, Chad, where where I wished I could have put that dude in with a with a, um, a white supremacist or something like, oh, whoops, you know, I didn't know the classification, you know, uh, yeah, I hated those dudes, man, hated them. You know, very seldom will we get a guy that worked in the Brill that'll come on and he'll talk, you know, kind of freely about what really goes on. And you, you know, you touched on. I think we're gonna have to do a part two. Um, we've been on here a little while, so I'm gonna get ready to close the show, but. Before I go, man, you worked in the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Yeah, I'm sure you've seen a lot of young kids come in there with a lot of time. Kids that you may have even felt like, damn, man, it's too bad this kid's got 20, 30 years, man. Maybe he didn't have a father. What message would you give to them young kids, man, that are on their way to federal prison if they don't get their life together? What would you say to them, man? Well, especially for dope. You know, um, due to the, 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 the war on drugs and mandatory minimums, you know, the, the feds, you can get picked up on a certain amount of dope and the feds can take it and say, oh, this is uh, intent with the, with the intent to distribute. You know, you're getting 30 years, you know, where like the Chomo might get six years to 10 years. You know, here's this kid, first time offender gets pinched for um, a felony, felony amount of dope and he'll get 30 years, 20 years. And he, so it's a society within a society and you don't know unless you know somebody that's been in in the prison system and knows the ins and outs you don't know what goes on in there you know and like that guy touched on in one of your interviews um you go in there you you can't click you can't you gotta click you can't you can't be your own dude you know you can fly under the radar for a minute but you're gonna get caught up you're gonna be like hey you're gonna hold this so even a dude that's getting pinched for, say, 22 months for dope, you know, um, picks up a weapons charge because he's hiding weapons or a, another felony amount of dope. He's hiding his cell for some shot color. You know what I mean? And the charges rack up or he's got to defend himself. And and, you know, the cells, if they're not padded, you know, you got stainless steel, you got metal. You know, if you got to defend yourself and you get a lucky punch in and knock the guy out, you're selling, and he hits his head just right and dies, guess what? You're done. There's there's all kinds of variants, you know? So you need to, the young viewers out there, you need to to listen what we're talking about. You need to listen to Chad and other people he has on this, on this, um, on this forum and really let it sink in. Or if you have a family member that's um, flying under the radar and, and um, hopefully it inspires you to pull that kid aside and say, look, man, you're, you're going down the wrong path. This could be a life ender. You know what I mean? No doubt. I'm going to get ready to close the show, man. And, you know, I appreciate you for coming on and, and talking so freely. You probably talk more freely than any other agent or cop or anyone that I've ever had on here, you know, correctional officer, guard. But I definitely appreciate you. I definitely appreciate your input. I'm going to tell the people, man, if you haven't already, Hit that subscribe button. Hit that like button. Share the video. With respect, Blood on the Razor Wire TV. Until tomorrow, we're out.